Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Lucy Parker, who's here to share with us her new book, The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. So have the roles and expectations of large corporations changed in our social landscape? Well, today Lucy's here to address just that question. So Lucy Parker is a former BBC documentary maker. She moved into business as a coach to executives on strategic communication. Today, she is well known as a top corporate advisor. In government, she led the UK Prime Minister's Task Force on Talent and Enterprise. So welcome to the show, Lucy Parker. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Marianne. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. What was the inspiration for writing this book? It was the work that I was meeting and my co-author, John Miller and myself, um, lead the the work for, for, for Brunswick around the world on companies that are aiming to deliver social value, social value alongside financial value. And we have been seeing companies really wrestle with this over recent years. Um, When we began more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago, if we started to talk about these subjects, most businesses would look at you quizzically and sort of think that there must be something idiosyncratic about you. And about five years ago, they started to say, yes, I I think this is a thing. Hmm, be nice if it happened. And now I really don't know any leading business that doesn't have this mainstream on its agenda, on the board agenda, on the executive agenda. And companies are asking themselves, how they can see that there is a new expectation for business leaders to step up to societal value as well as financial value. And most many want to do that, but it's a different paradigm. It's a different shape from leadership for. And so you can feel them. We literally experience it week by week, day by day. There's a sort of lean in and then a confidential almost whisper. I see that it needs doing, but the question is how? And we've spent over a decade helping businesses work out how, and the patterns of the leading businesses are really, really clear. So it felt like an important moment to share what we've learned over these years. Well, I'm so glad that you have, because you do touch into something that I haven't seen anyone else talk about to this extent. You, you, in your book, you talk about, you know, what kind of activist leader are you? So <laughs> can you share a little bit about that with us? Yes. The reason I laugh is that um, the the phrase, the activist leader, has so, sort of caught on, but it also had went through a sort of interesting barrier. We interviewed quite a lot of leaders for the book, and we work with many, of course, day by day. And if you say to many people in business today, the phrase activist, they sort of recoil. The activist has a picture in mind's eye, which is, you know, very unreasonable, very aggressive, probably idealistic beyond sensible. Um, and so businesses are very on the back foot about activists and are always defending themselves, whether they're if you like NGO activists or shareholder activists. And what we've been really seeing is that the leading businesses in this frame are stepping into the idea that they need to be activists, they need to own the agenda for change. So you go to the heart of what is an activist. Um, And I would say, I think we would say that anybody who is activist is looking at a major challenge, something that's very difficult to grapple with, and looking at the contours very clearly and thinking, this needs change. And the difference between an activist and everybody else is that people look at that and go, I hope somebody does something about that. An activist goes, I could do something about that. I should do something about that. And that doesn't mean that they do it all themselves. Um, In fact, all activists mobilize others. So it's about seeing that a lot needs changing that's very difficult and stepping into that space rather than leaving it to somebody else. And the reason I I laugh when you ask me is that actually when we first tried it on on, on a lot of very well-known 
public business figures, they would go, oh, I, I don't think I know, I, want, I don't think I want to be an activist. That, that sounds very unreasonable. And then actually, if you describe it in the terms I just have, they go, well, actually, I, I pride myself on doing that. that. That's the kind of leader I want to be. And that is our experience, that it sort of almost defines your leadership. If you think there are things in the world that we need to look at afresh and change how we operate a number of things. And most people, when they look at the problems in the world, go, well, hmm, I I don't think I can do anything. I feel helpless in the light of all of this challenge. But if you are a leader in a big business today, you're not helpless. You have levers to pull. You have things you can do, decisions you can make. And so it's actually very empowering to think this might be you. Well, I was really impressed. One of the activist leaders you talk about, and thank you for explaining that because I think a lot of businesses, they go, ooh, activists, like you're saying. And yeah, do recoil. people, yeah, do people feel the same way when they hear that? No, I think one of the important things, a really fun unlocker uh, for, for a lot of people, is we we cite what we call some activist archetypes. And people will sometimes think, well, there's only one way of being an activist, you know, and the big famous names come come to mind, um, great orators, or, you know, you have Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, as it were, as one's carrying a gun and one is one of the world's greatest orators. So people imagine these big public figures and a sort of bombast about it in one way or another. But actually, we profiled quite a lot of different activists. And one that comes to mind, um, marvelous story of Dunant, who in the 19th century found himself on on the battlefield um, and thought, this is not okay. I'm watching people from whichever side die and be injured in terrible ways. And he's a fixer. Take that archetype. He's a fixer. And he thought, I got to do something about that. And he ended up setting up the Red Cross. But then you look at somebody else who was in fact a a, a lawyer um, who actually thought to himself he was a he was a lawyer and he would on a commute and he started to understand the plight of a lot of people who really had no human rights at all when they were caught in the wrong place in the wrong country with no human rights and his insight into that led him to setting up Amnesty International and one calls him a mobilizer he had nothing except to mobilize other people's opinions, to get them to speak up, to get them to fight for people caught in really desperate situations. Or, or you could take um, Sela Elworthy, and she, we call her a bridge builder, because she just very quietly found safe spaces for people to discuss what could be nuclear policy in a way when the world was really anxious about it. She was just quietly getting people together and finding common ground. So there's many ways of being an activist. It's what in your personality, what in your modus operandi would you call on to make change? And everybody has different traits, but it's useful to know that it isn't the noisy, aggressive version that is always the winner. So why does the world need a new kind of business leader at this time? Well, I'm tempted to sound glib for a minute. Look at the world. Um, I don't mean that glibly. I mean, I think we are living at a time of what what we call multiple crises. Um, I've just come back from Climate Week in New York. Um, You know, the world gathers to talk about climate. Now, wherever you stand on the climate change, issue and the speed and the direction and so on. Actually, there is no business in any sector in any part of the world that isn't having to ask itself how to respond to the climate crisis. And everybody is just now waking up to biodiversity collapse. Um, And I would argue that in a couple of years, we may well find that that actually stands right there alongside climate. Well, many, many businesses end up in the soil. They make our food, they make our clothes. And the question of uh, soil health and things like that are really starting to press in on the risk registers of some of the big companies. And that's before you get to water or the health crisis or the food crisis or inequality crisis, which since COVID has lit up. Well, now people would say, but these are all big societal issues. What that to do with business? But actually, these major societal questions 
have now become critical business issues. Some businesses come at them via their risk register. It was a, a business, for example, in Italy just this summer, and we've all experienced an extraordinary summer for heat and floods, haven't we? Uh, an electricity company in southern Italy had to mobilize a huge amount of resources to cope with the fact that its supply went out. Why? Because its cables melted underground. Now, they weren't counting on that. They'd never seen the weather coming that meant that their supply cables would melt underground. And the cost of not having been ready for that is enormous. And indeed, the company and the governments around them were going, we just didn't think this would come this fast. So whether it's the, the crops are different, whether it's the water supply for your products, whether it's the uh, concerns on human rights or living wage from workers, um, these issues are not just outside a business. They are pressing in on companies. And so how you look at them as risk is one question. How you look at them as innovation and opportunity is another question. But it's very difficult to argue these questions have nothing to do with the way a business operates any longer. On a bigger scale, how are things different for a big business today? Well, I think um, when, when John and I started to do this work uh, 12 years ago, We'd been working in the corporate sector for a long time, but we, we we started to focus in on this arena. I think that if you raised any of these subjects, uh, the leadership of the company would say, oh, yes, there's a few people who are interested in this, and they're sort of down the corridor, go and, go and have a meeting with them. Now, this is absolutely on the executive agenda. I do not know any company in the world as a leading player in its sector that isn't having to work out how it deals with these questions. And that's a, sh that's a big shift because the model and the approach for some decades has been very clear. Let's assume listed company for a moment, though of course there are other forms of company. But the picture has been very clear that you take a strong market position, you draw your money in from your customers, and your consumers, and your key priority in the immediate term, get it to shareholders. And that has been the picture, draw the money from the consumers and give it to the shareholders. And that's been considered to be the only form of fiduciary duty, really. When you look at the really multi-crisis world that is changing the operating context of business today, um, the expectation is that businesses will actually have to deliver societal value as alongside financial value, not one instead of the other, not social value and therefore not financial value, but together. Now, that is a, a new expectation. It's a new question for business leaders. And their stakeholders are starting to tell them. We often hear when we're inside a business, people say our employees really care about this. They really want us to be on the right side of these stories. Shareholders are increasingly looking at these questions. The assets under management that include some aspect of societal societal issues has grown exponentially in the last few years. Um, suppliers are starting to wonder where they fit in the supply chain of these big companies. So the idea that you would have responsibilities to deliver outstanding performance beyond financial performance is new. And one of the things we do in the book is to sort of is map out the way companies go about that, the steps they can take to, to start thinking like this and start acting like this. Because, of course, most business leaders today, and there's many, many kinds of business leaders, not only the CEO, people who lead all, all parts of, of the operations of a business, have been trained more or less in really strong financial performance. They know what it is. They know how to deliver it. They know how to talk about it. They know what's expected. That bit they've got. This other bit, that's new, and they haven't got that. They haven't got a way of going about it. And yet what's really clear is that all the leading companies that do this stuff, they are following similar patterns. And because of what we were continually hearing, which is we're not sure how to go about it, it seemed sensible to start mapping it out. But that idea that financial and social value are part of what makes you a leader today that is really different. 
So we talked about climate crisis and biodiversity. Those were mentioned. Do we have other crises going on at the moment? Well, yes. I mean, the water crisis is extraordinary. Um, I remember a few years back, it was very high on the agenda. And I think as climate started to rise on up, um, water sort of in the in the dialogue, if you like, in the public discourse, took a bit of a back seat, but is coming back in a, in, in a big way. And you can see all over the world concerned about food. The food system is uh, giving people a lot of concern, whether that's the nutritional value, whether it's the amount of supply to feed a still growing global population, whether it's the imbalance of some people who go to bed hungry still and some people who go to bed with too much of the wrong kind of food, and simply the supply of food systems around the world. And because of the climate crisis and the water crisis, the way crops are grown around the world is changing. And that's, of course, before you get to the health crisis. And that's really captured people's imagination since COVID. Um, and the inequality of health outcomes and the lack of access for certain populations and the huge burden on health systems as these things come through and the new technologies promise wonderful potential new treatments, but at, at considerable costs. Um, and again, that's before you take on board that the health crisis is in some ways only part of an inequality crisis that is a lot to do with access to other things, whether it's access to human rights, access to justice, access to broadband, access to education. Um, and we see it saw the world light up, didn't we, after the George Floyd situation with uh, Black Lives Matter. But by the time it had spread around the world, there were many different kinds of inequalities being expressed under that banner. Um, so I think all of these are happening at the same time. And one of the things that really is confusing for business leaders is they're all connected <laughs> and they were not on the radar screen before. We've had people who are, you know, executives of, of very you know, um, strong traditional engineering companies say, I didn't ever have to expect to speak about abortion to my employees. These are these things all crowd in on the radar screen of an executive team today. And one of the things they say is, well, am I supposed to speak to all of them? I, am I supposed to know what to do about all of them? What is mine to do and what isn't? And that's one of the biggest things that, that I think executive leadership grapples with is every day there seems to be a new thing coming in and they don't know how to orient themselves uh, against the apparently never-ending flow. It would seem almost impossible to navigate through that. So, you know, for a uh, leader with an activist mindset, how do they determine these are issues that I um, feel that I can be on board with and and I'm not sure what to do with these? Yes. I mean, surely that question goes to the heart of it, doesn't it? And it, it's why we mapped out um, nine steps, because really in over a decade, these things are proven to be the things, and you've so much hit on it. Number one is focus. Which of these do you focus on? No business, no body can take on all of them. And so the crucial thing is to identify as a starting base, where should your business put its efforts? And in our experience, typically, they hone in on the ones where they have the greatest levers to to pull where there's it they are integrally involved with the questions in the outside world and, and that's quite important because um you know i can think of a, a big agricultural business which was very very uh focused on climate for uh, and, and to good effect for some some years because actually um the agricultural industry is a huge emitter of, of ghg gases and could see that things needed to change but interestingly is the biodiversity crisis began to emerge and one began to see the contours very clearly of, of that problem. They began to see that actually what they had to do was help their farmers move towards regenerative agricultural practices. Well, that's a huge thing. You can't simply, as a big global agricultural business, tell your farmers to do something different because this is a long-term change program. And so actually they've come up with really inventive, thoughtful ways of helping 
fund, incentivize farmers to make changes on parts of their land so that they start to see the benefits themselves in investing in these things. They start to give incentives for certain kinds of agricultural practices and so on. Now, that was because that is a big agricultural business and it lives or dies by the way the crops are grown and the long-term health of the soil. In another business, it might be access to medicines because you have medicines that are a life and death matter for your patients. And actually, when you look at the stress on the health systems around the world, you want to know where you can help those systems get to to the most vulnerable patients. So it is really almost without fail, the immediate things to go for do suggest themselves if you go, where is the big crisis in the world that we are integrally a part of, inherently because of the business we do, we're a part of it. And that sounds straightforward when you hear it, but one of the things we cite in in the book is uh, um, a pharmaceutical company which was was very well-meaning when it said to its employees in the US, um, you know, if we're going to move into the societal arena, what matters to you most? And the answer came back, gun crime. Now, there's a very good reason that communities in America might be deeply concerned about gun crime. But if you're a pharmaceutical company, there's very little you can do about that. But there's a lot you can do about access to medicines. So the question is, there's a lot you could do about antimicrobial resistance. So the question is, where are the challenges that really come to you as a business, and are you integrally involved with those? And it's interesting that this takes a, a mindset shift. We worked with a, a packaging company um, where the work they do is fantastic and they have very good reason to be proud of the work they do. It involves plastics like much packaging does and it involves resources of other kinds too. And the world was beginning to get really, really concerned, as you as you might understand, on on plastic waste. And the initial response from the company was, but that's nothing to do with us because governments say they're going to recycle the waste. Well, that may be the case, but when you look at the inflow into our world and into the oceans of plastics, the fact that governments all over the world and some of them very poor are meant to recycle the industry is pouring more in than any recycling outfit can manage in the world. And the reuse or or, uh, systems to change recycling are tiny because they were all fit for 10 years ago. The plastics problem is now a giant problem. So if you're a company putting plastics into the world, your consumers, your investors, your employees are going to say, what are you to that problem? You can't simply say it's somebody else's problem. So I think that what that what's happening is that the big challenges are starting to read very loud and clear on the radar screens of executives. And the, the most important thing is to think, what are we to that? And what is that to us? And then you start innovating around it. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Lucy Parker in regards to her new book, The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Dr. Richard London, who has 25 years of experience being known as the Man of Steel with the Heart of Velvet, presents the Life Wellness System, The Road to Yes, a mentoring system that brings you to becoming a wellness heir. Imagine having wealth, wellness, love, peace, and spirituality in abundance and balance now. Visit doctorateoflife.com or call 720-213-8021 for a free 15-minute wellness evaluation. Hi, this is Jana Wilson, author of Wise Little One, Learning to Love and Listen to My Inner Child, a best-selling prescriptive memoir in inner child healing. I'm also the founder of the Emotional Healing System. The inner child, simply put, is your feelings, both positive and negative. If you'd like to learn to love and listen to your wise little one, 
pick up my book at Amazon or visit my website at janawilson.com. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. The first thing you need to know about me is that I love my kids, but they are not my everything. They used to be, but that's when my entire life fell apart. In order to pick back up the pieces, I had to put the love I have for myself before everything else, including my kids. I'm Jessica Dennehy, and I own multiple businesses. I'm a best-selling author, and I have all the strategies that I've used to make my life what it is today. And I'm going to teach you how to do them in my new book, Selfish is a Superpower. So go get your copy today on Barnes & Noble or jessicadennehy.com. Announcing a revolutionary tool for wellness. Scalar Light has the ability to enhance and harmonize your own bio energies. With Scalar Light, you can get started in just minutes and begin feeling better the very next day. Scalar Light is a remote energy that gently and subtly works with your own body's bio energies, increases pro cellular wellness, and enhances your body's immunity. Experience the benefits of Scalar Light. Try a complimentary 15 day experience at scalarlight.com. In your hands lie ancestral patterns. These patterns shape how you think, what you struggle with, and experiences you love, your life pattern. We are going into the latest neuroscience of biological hand analysis, a realm beyond palmistry where science and the soul entwine. Hand analysis is the latest method to transform lifelong patterns. I am Master Hand Analyst Brent Bruning. Join us and visit thepowerinyourhands.com. Looking for a page turner? Cozy up to a fantasy adventure romance trilogy with The Girl in the Twall Wallpaper by Mary Kay Savarese. The second novel in the Star Writers trilogy, The Star Writers Club, is coming soon. Take the journey. Connect with Mary at www.marykaysavarese.com. Her books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. Pandemonium. Fast forward 20 years. A U.S. president seizes control of all U.S. missiles, the power grid, the banking system, and every computer in America as he hides in an underground bunker. Pandemonium, a captivating sci-fi thriller where a hidden war, psychics, aliens, artificial intelligence, and transcendental love collide with the latest media technology. Pandemonium, live to all devices. Get your copy on paperback or digital. Free sample at getpsychic.org. With Breath Hub, you'll experience the transformative power of breath as it harmonizes your body, mind, and spirit. Recommended by experts in fitness, sports, psychology, and medicine. Meet the scientific way of being well. Breath Hub. Breathe better. Live better. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Lucy Parker, who's here sharing with us her new book, The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. So Lucy, before I went for a break, we were talking about activism within businesses. Are businesses today using their activism to acquire and retain top employees? Yes, is the short answer. I think I might frame it slightly differently, but I would totally agree. I mean, I cannot think of a business that I've worked with where when you ask them why they do this, one of the first things out of their mouths is our employees care. And that doesn't matter if that's an oil and gas company or a dress company or a food company or a pharma company. And there are some companies, of course, which are absolutely famous for the work they do in this space. And they have people queuing up to join them. And they know that they've become the place in their industry to join. It's a massive asset to do this well. 
But of course, what doing it well constitutes is what is what's on the table, is what's at stake. Because this what we're looking at here is a new model. This isn't this is not how it used to be done. It used to be done as an adjunct on the side to a small degree. The leaders now are acting to a scale commensurate with the size of the issue in the world, the crisis, and commensurate with the scale of the company that they are. And that's, look, because a lot of business leaders say to us, you know, won't we get accused of greenwashing? And our experience is, if you are acting to a scale that's commensurate with the size of the problem and commensurate to the size of the company, and you're not saying, you know, we're good, we've got it licked, we've got it wrapped up. You're going, this is a big crisis. Our business integrally makes it part of it. We're doing this. We hope it's a contribution. If that that is the magic setup, and it really keeps you on the road and it keeps the employees doing it. If you speak ahead of doing, no, let me correct myself. If you speak and don't do, um, you're in you're in trouble because the world will come after you. What people want is demonstrable proofs that they're that companies are acting. The reason I corrected myself is in this space, one way of winning is to recognize the scale of the problem and to recognize that you are in a position where you could make change, you could help, you could do things. And very often, you're stepping into a space where you can't yet prove it. You have to say, we intend to, and then follow up. So I was wrong to use the phrase ahead of. Sometimes you are speaking of intent, and then you'd better get busy doing. I mean, the thing is, nobody in the world has these answers. So the courage you should take is where the whole world is looking at these questions. And if you're a big company, you're integral to these questions. And people are looking for solutions. So the opportunity is to be not not just not seen to be part of the problem, but seen to be part of the solution. But genuinely to move all big businesses, we are all individually also part of these problems. This is not a, a blame game unless you choose not to act now. As if uh, you pretend it's happening over there and has nothing to do with you, then that can be an issue, I would think. Uh, that's right. And I think because it, it, the activist part, you know, the, the names I cited, whether you're sitting quietly at a table with somebody trying to come up with uh, manageable nuclear policy or whether you're out there trying to generate rights for, for people locked up in, 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 in prisons uh, um, wrongly, you know, there isn't an answer. It isn't do do the right thing that's as established. What makes it activist is that you're prepared to start carving out a new way of looking at things, a new way of operating. And there are a few real telltale telltales of the of the leaders. You you can see the signals coming from the leaders. One is this acting to scale. Another is all the leaders in this space today are driving for systemic change. That's the differentiating factor. If you wound the clock back, say five years, maybe a bit more, take take water, which we mentioned, you would meet a company that goes, oh, we're very, very good on water. And you say, tell, tell us how, what are you doing? And what they mean is, what they had meant was, we're reducing water use in our organization. We're reducing emissions in our organization. We're paying our employees with these kinds of benefits. The leaders today see that all of these questions are big systemic questions, and they're using their scale, their influence, their the fact that they are big system players themselves, that they are system, they often are practically the system. They're using their levers to help drive system change. That's what makes a leader today. Are corporate investors demanding more of businesses more on a societal level today? Um, yes, they are. Of course, and particularly you here in America, this is a very conflicted area. Um, I think people, there's a lot of dialogue. Oh, ESG is 
over, you see on one page, oh, oh ESG is the new thing, or ESG is finished now, or uh, so, so and, and there's obviously a lot of very strong voices lining up against what is known as an ESG agenda, and there's also a lot of people shifting their language about ESG. I think if you look at it in a more measured way for the longer term, what you are seeing is this is about the delivery of long-term sustainable profitability. This is about risk mitigation. This is about taking the opportunity for innovation. So investors are starting to say, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a company that is producing palm oil, there is no way that this is not going to be heavily regulated all over the world, that consumers are disassociating themselves from things where they can see the palm oil, that there are new technologies putting eyes in the sky, satellites that can literally show to the point of a, a, a tree practically where the deforestation is coming from. This is all going to be highly visible. So the more data there is, and the data is growing all of the time, the more investors are going, show us where you are on these questions. So plastics, for example, uh, interesting. Uh, Coca-Cola was self-avowedly the you know, worst plastic producer in the world. They decided they needed to act on that. They're in 160 plus markets. They had no data on it. And they said, we need data in every single market about where our plastic waste is going. And so they started to publish annually a report on the 160 markets, where is the waste going in plastic? What are they doing about it? Where are the plans? How are they inventing new forms of plastic? How are they working with partners to change the bottling into different kinds of bottling which can be recycled more easily? This is a total systemic approach, but it's driven by having the data in the first place and the transparency. And one of the challenges that's often brought about whether or not investors are asking for this kind of information is, oh, but the data is inadequate. Yes. It is inadequate at the moment, but actually the activist leadership teams are helping to create the data, are helping to go, we need to report on this in the long run, so let's see what we can do to make the data more and more reliable. So the convergence of ways of looking at this in the investor population, the increasing data, the increasing call out for transparency is meaning that the anxieties people have about it will be dispelled over time. But what's actually happening is that the long-term pull, the current towards needing to be able to operate better within this context of massive societal challenges is part of how you need to approach responsible, long-term, sustainable profitability. So yes, investors are starting to go, where's the data? Where's your track record? Why aren't you doing as well as somebody else in the sector? Why aren't you reporting on it? So it's going right to the core of what a business is expected to deliver good performance on. Earlier, we talked about the nine steps in mm. thinking like an activist, and we talked about focus. Can you share with us the other the other steps that there is? Yes. Why don't I try and do it very briefly, or I'll keep you here all day and night? I think we say pretty firmly that it does begin with focus. It begins with where in this multitude of things you could focus on, could you make the biggest difference? And you want to be clear on why that matters to you and, and what you can do about it. But that then goes to perspective, which is the second thing. Um, if we were to be light <laughs> about the language for it, um, we positively differentiate between the corporate mindset and the activist mindset. Um, I've sat with many companies where they sort of smile ruefully when you go, yes, you can recognize the issues in the world, but if you're recognizing them with a corporate mindset, you're very often in a sort of citadel standing on the parapet and you're looking at these issues hove over the horizon and you're trying to squash them. You're trying to keep them out of the organization. You're trying to minimize them because you're looking at them as their impact on you. How do we minimize their impact on us? Where in this mindset where you need to deliver societal value alongside financial value, you step out into it and go, yes, that issue, that's a big issue. And we're analyzing and working on what we are to it and what it is to us. And we'll work with you in common purpose to do it. Actually, we were speaking a moment ago about palm oil. Palm oil is like that. 
you know, classically the companies have gone, well, we, we don't deforest. This must be happening somewhere else. And increasingly now they're going, there is still a deforestation problem in this industry. What can we do to be, disclose where the challenges are? How can we work with the supply base to change it? And that demands that you listen to the perspective of the people who actually know about deforestation. So this thing of stepping outside your comfort zone to understand what the real concerns are on this issue in the world actually informs and fuels your ability to be an activist. We, we've been talking about biodiversity earlier. I don't know if you've seen what Walmart's done on biodiversity. Extraordinary. Um, and of course, pollination is one of the biggest issues in deforestation. And they're asking their suppliers to work with different agricultural practices. 2,000 suppliers they brought together to say, you need to understand about pollination. You need to understand about uh, soil health. And they educated their suppliers in the same way they'd educated themselves. And then they said, that's why we're asking you to change your agricultural practices. They started first with an understanding of the issue. And I can't tell you how many business leaders I've met who, when they take the reins in a serious position, go out and talk face to face with the people who are most um, campaigning on these issues and say, explain to us the world you see. It really fuels your ability to make common cause and look at the issues afresh. Then the third is pivot towards the problem. Actually, don't ignore it. Don't say this has nothing to do with us. Pivot towards it and go, that problem, that problem you're pointing at, we agree it's a big problem. We're going to try and help. And that's adopting that mindset that you might have levers to pull. Then ambition. You know, you've got to have a big ambition and it fuels your ability to change things. You know, most of the big businesses in the world have been created by a big ambition when the business was small. And um, of course, Apple's made announcements just very recently about climate, but one of the ones that really impressed John and myself, which we feature in the book, is they were wanting to produce their laptops with much less impact on natural resources, and that meant recycling aluminium. And they discovered that the aluminium that they were using couldn't be recycled enough to make a big enough dent in the problem. So they invented a new form of aluminium. So it's this thing, if we've got a big ambition, we're seriously going to reduce the amount of natural resources we use. What would that mean we do? Which takes you very naturally to the next one, which is disruption. Do something different. Maybe what you're doing, you have to be prepared to look at a whole new way of doing things. Phillips. Um, produced light bulbs and started to think light bulbs are going to start being a liability. Suppose for our customers, we sold them light. We took responsibility for the collection of light bulbs, for the length of the light bulb um, in, in service and stuff like that. And we sold light as a service. We don't sell the light bulbs. And then you think, well, this is about taking it to the core of the business. This is not peripheral. This is not on the side. You know, we spoke about Coca Cola and data on on waste. That's now in the core of their business. They expect the leadership of the different geographies to turn up with that data, to turn up with a plan to minimize it. And they expect that to be reviewed as they would any other strategic plan. They build it into the core of the business. And then system-wide, if I had to call on one, as I said earlier, the fact of the matter is the leaders are all going for system-wide change. They're not just doing it in their business because they're realizing that the difference they need to make actually goes way beyond the business. And practically, you know, the story, I don't know if you've come across the Maersk story, um, Maersk, one of the biggest shipping lines in the world, and they'd committed, like many companies, to net zero, which took their engineers to recognizing that if you put ships on the ocean today, then actually they're going to be running at 2050. Is in a 30 year lifespans, these ships. And if you put fossil fuel based ships on the oceans today, they will be perpetuating the fossil fuel question in 2050. There were no ships that ran on non fossil fuels, but they commissioned some. And you know why there were no ships on, that ran on things other than fossil fuel? There wasn't enough non fossil fuel supply. So they started to invest in the supply of non fossil fuel for not non fossil fuel sources for those ships. 
And then they got together with their customers and got them to underwrite the use of those ships and so on and so on. They went across the system. They created the industry-wide body that started to say this has to go right across the system. So they produced a different product. They invested in innovation to scale up what was needed. They went into partnership with their customers. They took the industry with them. That's a system-wide view of what needs doing. You could take another organization, you could get H&M if they look at that and, and women in the supply chain in the emerging markets for, for clothing. They realized they couldn't do it by themselves. They set out to try and make model factories. They found it didn't work and they said, we've made a mistake. It's not model factories. It's how we work with the rest of the industry to shift the pay for the poorest women in the system. And they brought the women and the other apparel companies with them. So this is a system-wide game if you're serious today. And then, of course, advocacy. A lot of companies are now actually saying, you know, if, if you want a level playing field, if you want the companies to step up and take on some of these issues, it's got to go industry-wide. So what are the enabling policy conditions? How do you help your consumers understand why they should go for different kinds of products and services? So how you speak up as a company is very important. These are big companies with big footprints and, and big profiles. If you speak up about these questions, people are listening. And then finally, the last of the nine is, is momentum, because this is a long-term game. As I was saying earlier, this, the path is not carved here. And so you're not doing this one year and then on to something the next year. And the companies that really make it fly are the ones where when they hit a block, they go, mm, that was a problem. What are we going to do about that problem? And it becomes the next chapter of their story as, as activists. You look at what Microsoft's been doing on climate. Um, ha, we actually need to look at this differently. If we need to invest in carbon capture, then we can do it and we can share with others how we're doing it. It's, it's about keeping going and making the next thing, the next hurdle you meet, the next challenge you tackle. And that is the activist mindset. And all activists are doing that. They don't know the end. They're putting their shoulder to the wheel and they're mobilizing others to help carve out a path because these things need changing. So are big corporations the ones that are leading the change or is it mostly the governments that they're involved in? Um, are they the ones that are leading the change as well? Mm. This this again goes to the heart of the question, doesn't it? Um, I think that it's both. I think that um, this cannot be done without government policy around it, um, but it also can't be done without the big business players in the world doing it. Um, People are writing all the time now about the relationship between government and business in these things. You know, we all know, don't we, Silicon Valley was created in some ways by the partnerships and different roles people played. Um, I think that where you see really imaginative work, it's very often hand in hand with governments, whether that's interestingly at a local level, a regional level or a national level, or these days even at a multilateral level. So all the big sophisticated players in business are working hand in glove with government. But um, activist leaders are not saying, well, we'll do it when government does it. They're saying, we think this is necessary. What can we do to make it happen? I often think of it like you know, those parties you used to have as students where you know somebody brought the drink and somebody else brought the cake and somebody else <laughs> brought something else and you had a party. Everybody's got to bring what they can bring to the table. So the organizations that aren't activists fold their arms and say, well, when government makes us, we will. But actually, a lot of the activist businesses are showing that it's possible and giving courage to the governments. And they're calling out to governments to say, you know, th this can't be a few leading businesses that choose to do it. You need to help bring the corporate universe along and uh, step into this space. So it, it, it truly comes down to that activist spirit. When you look at the levers you can pull, what levers can you pull and how can you mobilize the commitment and energy and imagination of others? I found it interesting in your book. You um, It mentions about how one CEO did a town hall and was given 
some questions in regards to fixing the capitalism system. Do do, <laughs> do CEOs find themselves in that uh, predicament often? I think they do. And I think it's because, um, especially, not exclusively, but especially in the context of America, um, there is a polarization of the debate, which means that a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the idea that taking on societal issues is anti-capitalist and or not fiduciary duty. Um, as I was saying earlier, my experience is that if you're living in a world of these crises, it's a very strange business that doesn't look at them and, and, and work out how they need to adapt what they're doing to be successful within this changing operating context. But a lot of people take these big challenges either to be a mark that the capitalist system hasn't worked or on another end of a political spectrum that to take these questions on is not capitalist. I actually think that this is um, a loud voice at opposite ends of the spectrum where actually the great bulk of what's happening is business leaders aiming to be business leaders that can carve a path to the businesses they're running, being successful in the long term in a system that's successful and where they are staying at pace with society and regulation and their own business objectives. This is about long-term, sustainable, profitable capitalism. This isn't instead of. But because there's a lot of debate about this, it's unsurprising to me that not just employees, but people around are going to senior business leaders, what's your take on this? But everyone I meet, when they're acting on these questions, are acting on them because they're going, have you seen the world and the world we're operating in? You'd have to be really blinding yourself to these realities, not to think, what do I have to do in my business to step up to these new realities? The imperatives come from the way the world is changing. And that sort of transcends the conversation that tends to pull people to, from one end of the spectrum to the other about the language around capitalism. You want your business to be successful? You need to take on these kinds of questions. And it's really interesting. You asked about employees earlier. Very often, leadership, and of course, we should remember, you know, it's easy to go the leaders are the CEOs, but the leaders are distributed all across organizations. And, you know, some of them are in purchasing, some of them are in human resources, some of them are in the R&D department. Some are, there's leadership positions all over the place. And people are very concerned now about future leadership and young leaders. It's very hard to imagine how young leaders are going to want to grow up in a space where they don't take on these issues and deliver their financial value and social value proposition hand in hand. And today's leaders know that. So you often hear from them that they're younger employees and their children often are saying, where are you in this? When you see how the world is changing, are you not stepping into a paradigm that can deal with that? Um, so I think that, I mean, one of the lines in the book that we're very fond of in a way is that um, this is about how you think about being an activist leader and how you go about it because businesses have such enormous problem-solving capability. Business leaders pride themselves in their problem-solving capability. No business doesn't want to be innovative. Every business leader I've ever met says, give me the real deal. Talk to me about what's really happening. And strategy is only constant course correction. So to be able to deal with these issues is actually harnessing the problem-solving power of your business to tackle these issues, and it's hugely energizing. Um, it strengthens your, your sense of purpose as a leader. And uh, and the line I was referring to that John and I are very fond of is, is it can bring you closer to being the kind of leader you want to be. And what we've found in working with leaders over 10 years is once they start to grapple with this, it, really, it gives them a sense of, of their own growth and their potential as a leader. It's the kind of figure they want to be. Um, and so 
seeing how you go about it and how you build it in to the way you lead your business is is massively energizing for people. I know we've talked about big business a lot, and there are so many great examples within your book, The Activist Leader. Can these principles be used for medium to small businesses as well? Yes, they can. And 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 of course, you're so right to touch on, on that um, because we, we are writing a lot about big businesses. There's a very obvious natural way. I, I was citing Walmart earlier, gathering, you know, 2,000 suppliers and saying, we need you to change the game on, on agricultural practices. Um, it's very often that leaders, sorry, leaders of smaller businesses, their growth is part of the supply chains of these big businesses. And what you see is a lot of very powerful symbiotic innovation where companies are looking for their supply chain to find solutions on the front line and then scale them. So what you see is a lot of big businesses working hand in glove with smaller businesses where they can support them in creating innovations that then get scaled. The other thing is that, of course, a lot of smaller businesses are increasingly seeing that their growth is dependent on how they step into these new realities. All over the world, there are food food businesses being created that are trying to tackle the food system challenges we have, whether it's growing food in a, in a new way or producing produce that goes on shelves in supermarkets in a new way. That the entrepreneurial innovation that is coming out to tackle some of these big businesses is another form of small businesses almost showing the way to big businesses. And then, of course, another very powerful potential of small businesses is we touched a little bit on the on the question of uh, inequalities in society and so many of the facets of inequality show up in local communities and a lot of small businesses are very rooted in the communities they grew out of and there are very many pragmatic practical useful ways in which those businesses become part of the sort of prosperity and social cohesion of the communities they operate in, whether that's the way they offer skills or the way they recruit, whether that's the way that they support the uh, most vulnerable in those communities. The way that small businesses behave as a hub in their communities is getting more and more traction as people are trying to find ways of, of cohesive societies under cost of living pressure and long-term questions about access to some of the most fundamentals in life. So whether you're part of a global supply chain or at the heart of the local community or entrepreneurial in the face of these new realities, finding new ways of doing things, all of these principles exactly uh, are mirrored in the world of small business and, and enterprise and social enterprise. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It's a great pleasure. And um, I do feel that these questions are the questions on minds of leaders all over the world. And um, we're honored to be part of working with them on these questions. Well, thank you, Lucy. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. The Activist Leaders available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support your indie bookstores. You can also purchase this book directly from the publisher, Harper360, at harper360.com. To learn more about Lucy Parker and her work with The Activist Leader, visit theactivistleader.online for more information and to be part of her community. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.